our third and final risk is patent risk. Um, so this is even farther along in a drug's life when it actually hits maybe the end of its commercially useful life. Right. And I think a great example of this, we actually had um, one of our listeners write in about uh, questions on this stock. So I'm glad that we're talking about it today is PDL, uh, symbol PDLI. Um, PDL, basically, they get the vast majority of their revenue in royalties on patents that um, they own on monoclonal antibodies uh, for some of the best selling drugs in the world, drugs like Aviston. A highly complex, expensive drugs that are multi-billion dollar blockbusters, and they just were sitting back, raking in cash. And as a result, uh, they pay one of the highest dividend uh, yields out there. Um, however, uh, the patents have all expired on those uh, on those drugs, and now as a result, uh, PDLI uh, doesn't expect to get any meaningful revenue uh, from those drugs or from those patents uh, after this quarter. Yeah, thank you to Aaron in Oklahoma City who wrote in uh, asking about PDLI. He says that it popped up on a screener for him with these really impressive financials and was just kind of wondering what else there was to this story. And I, I think this is a really good way to paint the picture of what happens when patents expire. I mean, you can have a really awesome revenue generator and then it just dries up when generic competition comes in. But yeah, I, in this case, right, Christine, we're talking about over 80% of PDL's revenue, and it's just going to disappear. Yeah, exactly. One question that I do want to address with patent risk is whether or not you can trust what the company itself says. You know, maybe not so much your PDLI, but any sort of drug maker that says, oh, don't worry about it, we've got all these additional patents covering us through 2020 or whatever year. Yeah, we've seen that a lot more with biotechnologies that have complex, uh, biologists are complex to manufacture, and a lot of people are arguing, hey, we got method of use paths, we've got all these other things that could protect them, plus it's complex, you know, generic drug makers aren't going to be able to, to, to craft identical versions of it. Um, yeah, take everything with a grain of salt, you know, the, gen don't ever underestimate generic drug makers' ability to overcome some of these hurdles and obstacles. So. I think what you have to do is you have to look at it and say, okay, well, what do I think after reading uh, through the SEC filings, after looking at these companies' drugs and, and who's challenging whom, uh, what is my what is my risk in this regard? You know, I'd also throw it out there that you can have it go the opposite way too, where the branded drug actually does way better than you expect when generics enter the market. The best example I can think of this is Copaxone from Teva. Yeah, that was a really inter interesting story because, well, but part of that is because they created a longer-lasting formulation that re required fewer doses than the generic that was approved. So, you know, theoretically, if um, a new dose um, gets approved by the FDA for by the generics, then maybe you see Teva's sales slip off in that. Yeah, it almost is starting to seem like the more different aspects of risk you think about, the more complicated it gets. And some of these are really, really difficult to actually put an expected value on. I know Gabby on her show, the Monday Financials edition of the show, on, uh, talked a little bit about forecasting and how frequently analysts miss estimates hugely. And this is definitely something that occurs in biotech and healthcare as well, where it's pretty difficult to measure exactly what the, the level of risk is in all three of these things that we've talked about, the trial failure, the commercial failure, and the patent risk. So, Todd, ultimately, how what's the best way to mitigate all of these risks? Diversification. I mean, you, you need to make sure that you're not betting the farm on any one particular biotech uh, company. Uh, you can also reduce your risk by focusing on companies that have been there, done that. You know, you look at large cap companies like, you know, Celgene and Gilead that rake in billions of dollars in sales and have a tremendous amount of money that in financial flexibility that they're plowing back into their R&D budgets. That, that's a way to mitigate your risk, too. And then maybe sprinkle in some of these more um, you know, clinical stage companies that, that pose more risk, but don't expose yourself too, too broadly to them because we've seen with Celdex and Mankind uh, and you know, PLI potentially, um, you know, share prices can drop. Yeah, and that's also a really good way of learning the industry first, getting your feet wet before you start to go smaller cap, more niche players. Um, so yeah, I think that's really good advice.